Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. I got a bunch of visitors, let's see, from Longview, Texas. I lived there five years. All right. And uh, Longview Baptist Temple, you walk across 281 and go down in the woods and come up in my backyard. 309 Dancer lived over there. Anyway, glad to have you in Kansas and Missouri. Good to have you folks here. Tonight, we're going to be in John chapter 16, if you have your Bible. You open your Bible exactly to the middle. You should hit the book of Psalms. Psalm 118, I think, is the middle of the Bible. Open the last half to the middle, and you should hit Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament. So the New Testament is one quarter of the Bible. And you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four biographies of Jesus. John chapter 16. We are at Genesis Baptist Church. We believe the Bible is true, and evolution is the dumbest religion in the world. It's nothing but a religion. April 8th, uh, John 16. Why? heathen hate Christians. Hmm. Well, we're an old-fashioned, independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist, and we believe the Bible is true, and evolution's dumb. We're starting, we're rebuilding our whole creation seminar series. It's going to take about four years to do it, but if you get, oh, here it is right here. If you get uh, my seminar series, 50 bucks for the whole thing, part two, part one is where I cover the age of the earth, and we did, what, 12 sessions on that in the, every Friday night? And now we're starting on every Friday night to do some, redo seminar part two. What was the Garden of Eden like? Why did they live to be 900 years old? And I think you'd be surprised And how God's going to fix the world back. Okay, we are straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles, in the itty-bitty town of Lenox, Alabama, where God gets the glory instead of evolution. Come on and visit. It's all free. You guys didn't get to see anything yet, did you? The tour? Oh, I'll take you on the tour tomorrow. It's, this is a fun, fun place. We believe the Bible is true. If you want to help us to open for free, on our 777 Club. We don't charge anything. Haven't for eight years. Uh, let's see. Call my wife, Sandra, 855-BIG-DINO, extension 1, if you want to help. Give me a kind of tax write-off or something, you can do that. There's our website right there. Almost eight years now. This next Tuesday be eight years. Open for free. That's when we got the property given to us. Let's see. Okay, let's see. I'm going to find uh, slide number 2574. 2574. Enter. There. John chapter 16. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. In the last chapter, remember, he talked about how they're going to hate you. They're going to want to kill you. And he said, but you, you should not be offended. I told you it's coming. I warned you. He said, they shall put you out of the synagogues. The time cometh. Whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. Who thinks they're going to please God by killing Christians? Oh, well, the Muslims do. It's part of their religion. The Quran tells us, Make no friendship with the Jews and Christians. Kill the disbelievers whenever you find them, wherever you find them. Murder them and treat them harshly. Whew. Fight and slay the pagans. Seize them, beleaguer them, lie in wait for them in every stratagem. Wow. The Quran demands that we fight the unbelievers. Allah and his messenger want us to fight the Christians and the Jews. I mentioned last time there have been uh, 45,000 terrorist attacks since 9-11. We've got quite a few books we sell, if, if you want to get on, study this topic, and our, go to our bookstore, uh, drdiner.com. The book, Christ, Muhammad, and I, David Daniels, a good friend of mine, he took over with Jack Chick Publications, a great book on that. Peter Ruckman, Rude, Crude, Crass, Mean, and Brilliant, uh, down in Pensacola, Florida, wrote a great book on why I'm not a Muslim. Now, let's see, the Holy Scriptures versus the Quran by Peter Ruckman, just a comparison of the two. What does it say? Okay. Who is this Allah? Uh, who is this Allah they're talking about? Good, good, good study of that. Okay, number of fatalities due to terrorist attacks worldwide. Wow, 20, 30,000 every year? Yep. Let's see. Rishi Sharan wrote, since the inception of the third world cult of Islam 1,400 years ago, it's killed hundreds of millions of people. Spread like a cancer, bringing hate, theft, slavery, pedophilia, and murder. Hmm. Let's see. Academic estimates around 90 million to 1.2 billion people have died as a result of Islam. And it's a continuous war of religious expansion since the 7th century. 1,400 years of a single religion being at war with all other faiths, and they're at war with everybody. Okay? Since 2013, violent groups identifying themselves as Islamic have been the main cause of death from terror attacks in the world. 63% of all terror deaths are linked to Islam. Huh. Islam, they have decided they will dominate the world. And this ties into John chapter 16. Jesus warned his disciples they're going to hate you. Allah and his messengers announced it's acceptable to go back on our promise and obligation. You can make a treaty and then go back on it. That's part of their religion. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, they or he ordered his followers to fight the unbelievers until no other religion exists except Islam. 
They're to slay or crucify or cut off the hands and feet of the unbelievers, that they be expelled from the land with disgrace. They shall have great punishment in the world hereafter. We mentioned last time that Egypt bombed is, uh, Islamic State targets in Libya. 21 Egyptians were beheaded just because they were Christian. These were Christians taken out on the beach, cut their head off. You can laugh at Islam's world domination agenda if you want, but this clash of values will continue worldwide, either until Muslims are in full control or they're defeated. Yes, defeated. They will defeat us or we will defeat them. If we don't begin to think in those terms, we will lose. Compass, uh, Bill Perkins, good friend of mine, Compass Internet, Compass.org, a great, I preached for them many times uh, out in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Over 100 Syrians, dozens of Lebanese soldiers, 10 Kurds, two American journalists, three American and British aid workers were beheaded by the Islamic State in just the past year. These aren't war kills, rather mostly innocent humans who were murdered as a sort of appeasement to Allah. Consider Belgium. Hmm. For the fourth year in a row, the number one baby name is Mohammed. Even Japan, they have two hostages, Japanese hostages, they're demanding $100 million or so they will be beheaded. Since 16, 600 AD, Islam grew east and west. That, With the exception of the Crusader period for a brief time, around 1100 AD, Muslims basically spread and unchecked. unchecked. By the 1500s, they reached so far as to control all of Spain, Portugal, and Greece. In Islam, there is no promise of salvation. The Muslim believes when he or she dies, they stand before Allah to have their life's deeds judged, hoping he allows them into paradise. See, Christians, we can know you're going to heaven right now. They, they don't know that. There's one way they can know, though. I'll show you in a minute. The lone exception is to martyrdom, where the martyr not only is promised heaven with 40, 72 virgins, he could also bring with him 72 members of his family. So if you die for your faith, you get to go to heaven, 72 virgins, and bring 72 of your friends with. Oh. America's first war. Guess who the first war America fought was? Guess who? Islam spread through the fear of unloving, unforgiving God, who requires strict obedience to the Quran. Those who didn't convert had the choice of paying tribute, or bribes, or were killed, or by beheading. Imagine going on one of those mission trips. Worship Allah, or we kill you. We shake the heads of the tactics, but it's been hugely successful for 1,400 years. Most Americans think our first war in 1812 was against Britain, but that's not true. After, after our war for independence, our first war was actually against the Muslims. When the, we began as a nation in the late 1700s, along with the rest of the civilized world, we paid tribute, bribes, to the Muslims of North Africa to not attack our merchant ships. North African Muslims would go out attack the merchant ships coming from England back and forth from Europe to America, and had to bribe them or pay them to not attack your ship. When elected uh, President Thomas Jefferson was president, 1801, he didn't pay the bribes. We ain't paying it. It's Donald Trump's attitude, okay? Interesting, Jefferson did not just stop paying taxes. After reading what was in the Quran, he also sent a fleet of American ships to bomb the, the smithereens out of North Africa coastal harbors of Tunis, Tunis, Algeria, and to Tripoli. Only after repeated pummeling by the Americans did they agree to allow our ships safe passage. Hey, we beat the devil out of them. Guess what? That's where the marine song comes from. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles on air and land and sea. My dad was a Marine World War II. Praise God for you veterans. I apologize for our stupid politicians, but thank you for defending our country. Okay. As of April 08, Somalia is a Muslim country with a population of 15 million. According to the Federal Ministry of Endowments and Religious Affairs, 99% of the population is Sunni Muslim. The Shafi school of Islamic jurisprudence is practiced. Other religious groups comprise less than 1%, a small Christian community of about 1,000, small Sufi Muslim community, unknown number of Shia Muslims, Hindus, and others. Islam is strongly linked to Somali national identity. Anybody heard of Somalia in the news in the last couple months? Watch this now. Somalis, regardless of their clan affiliation or cultural background, the teaching of Islam is compulsory for pupils in both public and private schools. No other religion than Islam can be propagated in the country. There is Somalia, off the horn of Africa sticking up there. Somalia. Well, just like they used to do in 1700, they're doing the same thing. Pirates going out and attacking ships. 
How many Somali pirate attacks in 2020, 2022, 2024, 2023? They go out and attack ships and either seize the whole cargo ship or hold them ransom. They go out with their fast boat, they call it. And some of the some of the navies, like India, their navy is getting upset with it. And they're going, they're blowing them right out of the water, okay? So global economy incurred, incurred a colossal loss at the peak of Somali piracy. World Bank estimates they kidnapped seafarers and received United States $339 million and $413 million as ransom for hijacked ships. Hijack the ship, pay us money, we'll give it back. Same thing did Thomas Jefferson said, we ain't doing that. I'm curious to see if Donald Trump gets elected and see what happens. We'll explain it to him in language they understand. Okay? Let's see, marine insight. What are the causes of marine piracy in S Somalia? Somali, over the years, have lived under the most trying circumstances unimaginable, facing acute poverty, lawlessness, and anarchy. Of course, a lucky few defected from their homeland and escaped the rigors of the Civil War, which brings up a major point. Uh, to Thomas Jefferson, you can't fairly negotiate with a Muslim. The Bible says Arabs are born irrational. Article from Compass in, uh, Compass .org. You may think you're negotiating, but they simply lie about their intentions and they love to fight, which is irrational. If you don't knock them in the head, they don't get it. Israel, surrounded by Muslim enemies, has found this out the hard way. Haven't, didn't they find it out since October? Yeah. Well, see, here's how it started. God created Adam about 6,000 years ago. You can get my chart right here. And our, oh, upside down. The Bible dates show that before the flood came in the days of Noah, the people lived to be 900 years old. These are heavy laminated for placemats on your when the table when your skeptic friends come. On the back is all about Grand Canyon, how it formed in probably a week. Okay. Well, then we go down to a fella after the flood named Abraham. Dates drop off, lifespans drop off 400, 200, 100. You get way down here to Abraham. So 2,000 years after the creation, God made a promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I've got a promise to make you. So the flood took place. Noah, Abraham actually could have met Noah. We don't know that he did, but he certainly, I would bet, man, if you were alive anywhere in the world, that'd be something you'd want to do in your lifetime. Go meet great, 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 great grandpa Noah. He's still alive. It'd be pretty cool to meet a guy who's 900 years old and could tell you about building the boat. He could tell you the flood story himself. And he could tell you what it was like before the flood. Yeah, okay. So Bible dates add up to about 6,000. 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood, and that explains all the geology that we see. I can't believe in our schools we are still teaching the kids that stupid geologic column, that the layers are different ages. Guys, if the top layer is younger, I keep asking them, where is it coming from? Outer space? All the layers, there is no geologic column. I taught her science 15 years. I'll debate anybody on that. There is no geologic column. All the layers form sideways while the motor's moving sideways in Noah's flood from tidal pumping. Are these layers in here different ages? Oh, right here. If I flip this over, it's going to make a bunch of layers. No, they're all in here at the same time. There's no geologic column. Sorry, guys, there's no such thing as a Jurassic period. Anyway, Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and here we are today waiting for him to come back. And the eclipse had nothing to do with it, okay? There's anywhere from two to five eclipses every year, somewhere in the world. Two lunar eclipses every year, average. So it's nothing. I watched some of it, said, okay, that's neat. I've seen about 13 of them. I'm back to work, okay? So if we blow up this part of the chart right here, Abraham, God made some promises to Abraham. There's Jesus' crucifixion. Then several hundred years later, we come to a guy named Moses who wrote, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, he edited Genesis. That's an interesting story there. But God called Abraham in chapter 12. Now the Lord God had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house to a land that I will show thee. God said, Abraham, leave your family, go to this land. He didn't quite obey. He brought his nephew Lot with him. And Lot ended up going down to Sodom. And there's a long, sad story there. How many of you have ever made a dumb decision that ended up costing you a whole bunch of money over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years? Yeah, okay. <laughs> God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. <clears throat> I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. So God called Abraham in chapter 12. And there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn. Big mistake. 
God told him, this is your land, stay here. He didn't quite obey. He went down to Egypt. And this is where the whole problem started with the Somali pirates, believe it or not. Right here, 4,000 years ago. Chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, O Lord, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? I don't have any children, Lord. He'd been married to Sarai for years, five million years, and no children. He said, Thou hast given me no seed. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So God promised him a child. More than that, he said, you're going to have more descendants than you can count. It's going to be like the stars of the sky. He brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars. If thou be able to number them, he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Huh. We come to chapter 16. Abraham still doesn't have any children. Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian. Where, I wonder where she got that handmaid. Abraham had a lapse of faith, should have stayed in the promised land. He went down to Egypt, stayed there for a while, got a, got a servant girl for his wife to take care of the dishes and you know, run the laundry and all that stuff and run the dishwasher, whatever they did back then. Okay. And she brought her back. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Did somebody else? No, that was Adam that hearkened to the voice of his wife and had trouble. Wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here we have Abram says, okay, honey, I'll marry your servant girl. And he did. Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid. And Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to wife. He went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when all she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her life. Right here is where the whole problem got started. That servant girl, that Egyptian girl. So the angel of the Lord said to her, this is talking about the servant girl, uh, Hagar, the Egyptian, thou art with child, and thou shalt bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. He will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. This is the beginning of the people that are following, most of them, Islam. They're wild men. They're fighting everybody. They love to fight. So when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared and said, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm ready to give you a child now. He said, Lord, I already got one. Can't you bless Ishmael? He said, no, you and Sarah are going to have a child. He said, Lord, I'm 99. She's 90. Uh, you know how it works, Lord? Oh, yeah, son, I made it. Okay, I know how it works real well. <laughs> I can handle this. <laughs> Neither shall thy name be called Abram. It shall be Abraham, father of many nations. So here's how it works. This family tree. I don't know who this Rachel Pyle is, but that Rachel, thank you, did a good job on this. Adam had Abel, Seth, Abel, and Cain. Cain killed Abel. And then Seth had a bunch of kids, Enosh on down to Noah. Then after the flood, Noah's son Shem had Arphaxad, Selah, Eber, and Peleg. You can read these guys on the chart right here. So you got Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, Eber, Peleg. The Bible says in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. And I cover on my video number six of my series. What happened in the days of Peleg? Well, there's four different theories. One is the languages were divided, the Tower of Babel. Another is the uh, uh, people started drawing lines on the property and said, hey, let's draw a few lines. This is my property. That's yours. They divided up the land. Okay? This is my 40 acres. That's your 40 acres. So there are several different theories of what, what that means the land was divided. Uh, but in the days of Peleg. Now, after Peleg, you come down to Ru, uh, Sureg, Nahor, and Terah. Terah had a son named Abraham, and he had a nephew over there named Lot, a grandson named Lot. Abraham took his nephew Lot with him, and that's where the Sodom and Gomorrah story comes in. Abraham was a great man, but he made a couple little mistakes. How I many of you have tried most of your life to do right, but you made a couple mistakes that cost you a whole bunch, okay? Yeah, you understand. So Abraham had Isaac, the one promised child, and now he had Ishmael. 
And this is where the problem started. So Abraham, by Hagar, the Egyptian, had this son, Ishmael. And he also had another wife named Keturah, and she had a son named Midian. That became the father of the Midianites. And you read about them all through the Bible, causing trouble for the Jews. Edomites and Moabites. And it, 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 what a mess, okay? You just, you know, just obey God, okay? Just don't mess up. It'll cost you a whole lot less. So Abraham, Ishmael had eight nations born from him, had a bunch of kids, and eight nations come out of Ishmael. So Muslims have broken every treaty they've ever signed. The only thing Muslims truly understand is pain and consequence. They only wave the white flag if the pain is so great they think they'll lose the battle. But surrender is only a delay until they can attack later. They don't really mean it. We surrender, we surrender. No, you don't. That means stop fighting so we can rearm ourselves. Okay. <clears throat> Muslims are to behead their foes. The Quran, their Bible, calls for beheading the enemies. Here it is. So when you meet those who disbelieve, strike their necks until you have inflicted slaughter upon them. That's in Surah 47. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve, so strike them upon the necks. Surah chapter 8. Hmm. Islam will dominate the world. Uh, <clears throat> Bill Perkins, <clears throat> a good friend of mine, Compass International, wrote this article. Our mostly Christian founders fought for these principles, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, press. None of these are allowed under Islam. Hmm. One of the topics of Stealing the Mind conference is beheadings and the Bible. I'm going to get that one by at compass.org. Okay, here's Bill, Bill uh, and his family there and all the staff. These are the countries that are currently under control of Islam, where they will behead people if they violate their laws. Now, Jesus told them, Remember the word that I said to you, the servant's not above it, greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. They hated him. Now, here's one little ray of hope, okay? Last, after last night's, yesterday's message, some people said, wow, it looks bad. Yeah, it does look bad, but pay attention. In Daniel chapter 2, God gave King Nebuchadnezzar a dream. He woke up in the morning terrified of the dream he'd had. And all his wise guys came in and said, well, King, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. He said, I forgot the dream. You tell me what I dreamed and what it means. They said, oh, king, nobody can do that. And the Lord said, Daniel, go talk to the king. I'll tell you what he dreamed and what it means. So Daniel goes in, said, king, you dreamed that you saw a giant statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. He said, that's right. That's what I dreamed. How did you know? God told me. He said, now, King, this dream represents the empire at Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold. The second one is going to be the Persians, and then the, that's the uh, medio Persian Empire, and then the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, and then the iron legs of the iron legs represent the iron legions of Rome. There's going to be two, eastern and western division. Then you've got the last empire is the feet, part iron and part clay. And I cover this in my video series, Whoa, What on Earth is About to Happen, in great detail about this vision. And my book I wrote, What on Earth is About to Happen, it ties right into today, okay? This vision from 600 B.C. of the dream of the statue. So in the book of Daniel, you got this statue. You got the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron. And then at the end of the dream, Nebuchadnezzar is seeing this giant statue, and a stone comes flying out of the sky and hits the thing on the feet. And the whole thing crumbles, and, and the wind blows it away. And the stone grows to become a mountain. And he said, Daniel, what does this dream mean? What does it mean? And Daniel told him. Daniel chapter 2. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided. There shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. I've prayed hundreds of times, Lord, I want to be someplace where it's broken. I think Lenox, Alabama's. One of them places, hope so. I would not want to be living as a Christian in Iraq right now, or Iran, or Syria, or Egypt. 
Thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So maybe there's hope uh, during this tribulation time, there'll be some spots in the world where the kingdom is partly broken. Praise God for that. So in the days of those kings shall God set of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. This is the stone that smote the image and crumbled it all. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it break in pieces the iron, brass, clay, silver, and gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. I like Daniel. Boy, he's got confidence. Hey, king, this is what you dreamed, and this is what it means. The king said, man, you're right. Now, in John chapter 16, Jesus told his disciple in 15, you're going to be persecuted. They're going to kill you. They're going to hate you. All these things will they do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. This is why they hate. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the right Lord. The Lord that they think they're worshiping is actually Satan. And they get mad when you tell them that. But you want to read. Who is this Allah that they pray to? Read about it. This book is fabulous. How much is it? Uh, I don't have a price on here. You ought to study that. I like the one by Peter Ruckman. Why I'm not a Muslim. Look, I just want the truth. If they've got the truth, I'll switch tonight. I just want the truth. What is, I want, I want to know, I want to know the true God, the creator of the universe, and serve him. And then the Holy Spirit, in verse number four, these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you. And these things I said not to you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? And because I said these things to you, Sorrow hath filled thine heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for me that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. See, Jesus left, and the Holy Spirit comes down now, and he can comfort us, even to the point of death. Many people just marvel at the Christians that they behead in some of these countries. They're captives, or they're, they're behead, they're, they're, the guys with the sword. How can you die like this, just with peace in your heart? We're going to kill you. Oh, you're going to send me to heaven. I like John R. Rice. This guy broke into the church one time, pointed a gun at him and said, if you don't quit this preaching you're doing, I'm going to kill you. He said, you can't threaten me with heaven. I like that attitude. When he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Who's the prince of this world? Well, in, back in John chapter 12, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. John 14, I'll not talk with you much. The prince of the world cometh. John 16, where we are, because the prince of the world is judged. We'll take up next time. Who is this prince of the world and what's going on anyway? But there are people that just plain hate Christians because their book commands them to. They're, they think they're obeying God. Jesus said they're going to, they're going to think they are do, they think they do good. I'll show it to you again. Two o, oh, no no no, it's not it. Uh, I'm sorry here. One more time. Got to get the right slide. Twenty five, seventy four. Okay, twenty five, seventy four. Uh oh, did I do it? PowerPoint. Anyway, he said they're going to think they do God's service. And boy, they do. They think they're doing right. The time will come. Whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. They really think they're, get, they get to go to heaven. If they kill you, they get 72 virgins and 72 friends get to go with them. What a dumb, dumb, dumb religion. Okay, any questions or comments? Why follow and apply the Old Testament when we're not under the, Old Testament, under the law? Well, Jesus fulfilled the law. Now, we don't have to obey that to go to heaven, but it, the law still shows God's attitude. The, God gave that law because that's the way he feels. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't you know, uh, honor thy father and mother. So the law has not changed. It's just been fulfilled. I don't have to obey all that in order to go to heaven. I should obey all that in order to please God. Okay, good question, though. Let's see. <clears throat> Carrie. 
Who are the two olive trees and lampstands in Revelation 11? Carrie, I wish I knew. Don't know. I've studied it. I've got four or five different theories on that. Don't know yet. Okay? And if I'm not positive on a topic, I usually try to say, well, I don't know. So uh, until I find out, uh, I'll let you know when I do. Okay? You're such a faithful servant of God, Brother Kent. Thanks for giving us plenty of ammo to bring more souls to Christ. Well, good. Please go do it. Go win somebody to the Lord. Okay? One, somebody, one guy said, I don't like the way you do it. Why do you do it? I'll do it better than your way. Okay? Do you believe most atheists want to kill Christians? Oh, I don't know. I can't judge their heart. Uh, there's, there's quite a wide variety of atheists. Okay? I would put them all in the category of stupid because they believe, you know, they came from a rock, but some are nice, some are mean. Watch all my debates. I'm 356 now. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think they all want to kill Christians. Uh, can a person trust the methods used to date the manuscripts of the Bible? How can that person claim the Bible texts aren't forgeries created yesterday? Well, that's a good question. There's a website, several websites that deal just with that, the authenticity of the manuscripts in the underlying Bible. Uh, we got some books we sell on that topic. I don't have any here. Well, tell you what, go to uh, Jack Chick uh, website, uh, chick.com, C-H-I-C-K. Look what's missing, Chick Publications. This is a good one. Things that are different are not the same. Mickey Carter, that was my wife's pastor for many years. We cover all, We have a lot of books on why the King James and the history behind it. You really want to go to Gail Ripplinger's website, AV, authorized version, avpublications.com. Great stuff on that topic. Okay? All right, let's see. Question after today, the rapture is salvation removed. Oh, after the rapture, is salvation removed. Can someone still be saved by not taking the mark of the beast? They're not saved by not taking the mark, but uh, they're still saved by the blood of Christ. But yes, God's not willing that any should perish. And when the wrath of God falls on the world, which is uh, right here on my chart, uh, the wrath of God falls after we're taken out. Then there's about a three-year period of the wrath of God I was confused for many years as a Christian reading my Bible when you read about the day of the Lord. It's pretty obvious the day of the Lord represents this thousand-year period here, which I have broken up. It's actually got two parts to it. Hundreds of verses talk about the day of the Lord being a day of vengeance and a day of wrath. And other verses talk about the day of the Lord being wonderful. You know, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, the lion and the lamb lay down together. It's got two parts to it. The day of the Lord starts off with the time of great wrath. And... We're up at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're not even anywhere near here. And some people can still be saved during that time. Even God is not willing that any, any should perish. You can, there's always a time. You can, you can give your heart to the Lord on the deathbed. There's one guy in the Bible who's hanging on a cross next to Jesus, about to die. Got saved at the last minute. Now, his life was wasted, but his soul was saved. So, okay. Any more? Okay. Why is he answering questions we don't even see? Why, that I can't tell you. I don't know. I just like answering questions, okay? Some, one, one guy said, why do you always answer a question with a question? Why not? Okay. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye.